actual color for happiness. Uh, so that's why I picked that up today. Let me, before I acknowledge some really good friends with us today, let me start on an unhappy note. And by the way, thank you all for, uh, for coming out today, both behind me and in front here. And I know we're here to talk about the budget, but I want to quickly touch on the national furor over the Trump administration's policy of separating the families of immigrants. Later today, I don't think it's a ceremony, but later today I will sign an executive order to prevent any state resources from being used to help federal authorities separate families. New Jersey will not be a party to this utterly inhumane policy. Ever since our founding, and you can argue even before, our nation has been a beacon for families seeking freedom and yearning for a better life. President Trump has turned this premise on its head by doubling down on his inhumane and cruel policy of separating families. Housing children in cages should send chills down the spine of any right-thinking American. Trying to prevent members of Congress from even seeing the conditions in which migrant families are housed, as members of our own delegation experienced on Sunday, Messrs. Pallone, Pascrell, and Sirius, defies any sense of logic. That these det detainment practices are being conducted in Elizabeth, New Jersey, within mere miles of the Statue of Liberty, is beyond abhorrent. Let's be perfectly clear. Our federal law mandates no such action. This is an appalling policy choice implemented by President Trump, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and White House advisor Stephen Miller, and them alone. It has no basis in law or scripture, no matter how many times the president, the vice president, or anyone who tries to defend this policy tries to spit it. This has nothing to do with Congress or with Democrats or Republicans. This is a matter of human rights, human dignity, and basic humanity. I am proud to join the voices from all sides of the political spectrum and from respected leaders in our communities of faith in condemning the President's decision to allow such inhumane treatment of children and families. This is America. We know better and we can do better. Thank you. With now to the topic uh, of the budget. Good afternoon. It is great to be here with Transportation Commissioner, no longer any acting stuff, Diane Gut gutierrez Kaketi. Uh, five feet to my left. We get NJ Transit Executive Director Kevin Corbett in the house. Kevin, how are you ATU President Ray Graves. Ray, you behind me? You've got my back and I got yours. We're also joined by some other dignitaries. County Executive, Mercer County Executive, my dear friend Brian Hughes is with us. Uh, Mayor-elect Reed Gassiora. Reed, great to have you with us, ma'am. And some other uh, representatives of, of some great organizations. Tim Rudolph is behind me, president of IFPTE Local 195. Ron Sable, yeah, 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 let's hear it for Tim. Uh, Ron Sable to his right, legislative director for NJ Smart, which is sheet metal, air, rail, and transportation. My friend Fred Potter, international vice president of the Teamsters. Anna Lilia Meja, executive director, New Jersey Working Families. Renee Kubiatis, executive director, Annie Poverty Network. Ed Potasnik, executive director of the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. And then, if that weren't enough, we've got some members of uh, TWU, the Transit Workers Union, and uh, colleagues of Ray from the ATU Amalgamated Transit Union with us today. So to each and every one of you, thanks for joining us. And we're being protect protected by the extraordinary men and women of NJ Transit's uh, police force. So thank you folks as well. We're all here at the Trenton Transit Center for a reason. Over three months ago, I presented a budget that would make a historic reinvestment in NJ Transit and in the nearly one million everyday New Jerseyans who rely upon safe and reliable mass transit, whether for their daily commute or to get across town. The $242 million investment 
a near tripling of state support after Governor Christie cut its funding uh, to a low by, by 90, 90 percent. That investment would allow NJ Transit to begin the long process of writing itself. This is not abstract. We are talking about the lives and livelihoods in the realest of terms. We are reminded every day of the shortcomings left by years of budget cuts and mismanagement. Our budget would provide for the hiring of more than 110 sorely needed new employees to make the system work for riders, new bus drivers, maintenance workers, and engineers. It would mean a multi-million dollar investment in maintenance and in new software to keep the systems running on time. It would expand services. And it would begin, begin to pull NJ Transit's finances out of the mud where they have been stuck for far too long. All of this can be done right now without asking commuters to shoulder a rate hike. What's more, there is broad agreement that this is the right course to turn NJ Transit around. But for us to truly remake NJ Transit and ensure this progress is more than just another in a long line of Trenton's broken promises, then we can't have a one-shot or a two-shot infusion once every decade and expect to fund a safe and reliable mass transit system. We need long-term and sustainable revenues year over year to do so. I find myself, frankly, self-critically to have talked about the long ramp up we need to fully fund public education, or the long ramp up we need to achieve universal pre-K, or the not quite as long, but the ramp up to make college or community college or higher education more affordable. Uh, we probably haven't spoken enough about this one investment in NJ Transit is the beginning of a journey. When you're digging out of a mess that's been, making, that's been made for eight years, you can't turn this thing around overnight. We're gonna need year in, year out, sustainable sources of revenue to fund the investment that we need to put back at NJ Transit to reclaim its rightful place that it used to own, which is among, if not the premier commuter rail and bus system in the United States. This principle of sustainable year in and year out revenue is what I'm fighting for. And sadly, from what I understand, although we still haven't seen the budget, I believe it's coming off the fax machine uh, as we speak, it's the principle missing in the budget the legislature is writing. As we understand it, the legislature's budget includes roughly $1 billion in new revenue, but all of which would disappear after two years. So I ask, how is any commuter supposed to believe that we're serious about fixing NJ Transit, which is going to be a multi-year process, as I mentioned, if we don't have a concrete plan to get us there? How are the people of New Jersey expected to believe that we're serious about fixing any of the long-term issues we face without the sustainable revenues to keep our promises. This is the mindset that I am trying to break here in Trenton. We cannot do this from year to year. We cannot enter every June in crisis trying to figure out how we're gonna keep the lights on, let alone invest in the big things New Jersey needs for its future. It's one of the reasons why New Jersey is in one of the worst fiscal conditions of any state in these United States. I refuse to look only at the short term. I refuse to be boxed into this false notion that some have that we should just be content to look at budgets one at a time and go from fiscal year to fiscal year by the seat of our pants. This is how we dug ourselves into the hole we're in now, and it stops now. We can no longer ignore long-term issues confronting our state for the sake of politics. Whether it be the starving of NJ Transit that led, by the way, may I remind everybody, to a 36% rate hike for commuters, or rising property taxes stemming from our inability to fund our public schools, or pushing off our pension obligations into the future, or any of the other creative uh, yet unsound ways the state has found to kick problems to the next year, we live with those past bad decisions every single day. As I said yesterday, the people elected us to break the cycle of Chris Christie politics, not to have them seep into yet another year for the sake of gamesmanship. I am committed to breaking this cycle. I'm committed to a budget that is fiscally sound and based on permanent and sustainable solutions that can carry us forward. At the end of the day, 
That's what we owe the commuters right here. It's what we owe the people of New Jersey. With that, it is my honor to ask to come to the podium our Commissioner of Transportation, Diane Gutierrez Scacchetti, to say a few words. Thank you, Governor. I echo the Governor's comments entirely. Stable transportation funding is the foundation of a strong economy. This could not be truer for our transit system. Our neighboring states and cities offer a wealth of job opportunities to New Jersey's working families. Without a sustainable transit system that offers time-reliable trips in those cities for those who use the system, these opportunities are lost. A strong transit system is the underpinning of a fairer economy. To those who cannot afford an automobile, it provides access to services that would otherwise be out of reach. Transportation, in all its forms, is an essential service. There have been no more vocal advocates for stabilized transportation funding than those members of the New Jersey Legislature that I have had the honor to meet. Most specifically, the elimination of the capital to operating maintenance transfers. This budget is the first step toward addressing the financial woes faced by New Jersey Transit. However, without a sustainable funding source upon which good financial planning can occur, this is only a band-aid. Without a stable funding source, the advancement of so many important transit projects is tentative. Transportation planning and finance is a multi-year process when done right. We are no longer in a position to kick this financial can down the road. While some may say we must consider the here and now, I would suggest that our vision must be toward the future. The fiscal 19 proposed budget starts that process. Thank you. Thank you. Well said, as always. I'm looking up here, most of the trains are on time, Kevin. The, uh, the Crescent is an hour and 15 later. I just want you to know that. Uh, that's Amtrak, Kevin reminds me. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, my friend Ray Grease from the Amalgamated Transit Union to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Ray Grease with the Amalgamated Transit Union. We represent all the 10,000 transit workers here in New Jersey. Uh, but I'm here today to talk about the governor's budget. Uh, which the ATU strongly supports. You know, we went through a campaign cycle last year, and I'm a little angry I'm here today talking about this because this should not be happening here in New Jersey. It was a campaign run last year, and transit riders and transit workers and the people who rely on mass transit here in the state of New Jersey almost, well, almost overwhelmingly supported our governor overwhelmingly supported most of the people in the state legislature who said they were for sustainable, affordable mass transit here in the state of New Jersey. It's appalling that we would have any legislators at this time turn around and look the other way. At a time when transit riders need relief, we went through eight years of hell, 36 percent increase in fares, a 90% loss in revenues for New Jersey Transit. It's time to rebuild this organization, this agency that was once the envy of every other transit agency in this country. We're here today to say we support the governor's budget, we're for tax fairness, and I ask our legislature, I ask our democratic leadership in the State House, which side are you on? Are you on the side of commuters and workers, the middle class and the poor, who need tax fairness, or do you stand on the side of millionaires and corporations that don't give us a penny here at New Jersey Transit? People of New Jersey, wake up. Commuters, wake up. I urge you, contact your legislators today, now. Let them know we need tax fairness, pass the millionaire's tax, pass a budget the governor's budget that, support, that supports sustainable, fair, equitable mass transit here in the state of New Jersey. Thank you. That's a hard act to follow, but Kevin, you're going to have to follow it. Executive Director of NJ Transit, Kevin Corbett. Kevin. Thank, thank you, Governor, and uh, certainly between my uh, Board Chair Diane Scaschetti and uh, Board Member Ray, it's, it, it both are a very tough act to follow. 
Uh, certainly, at my, my responsibility as executive director is to rebuild the agency and provide commuters with high quality, safe, reliable service that they need and deserve. Gov Governor Murphy's leadership has been great with the budget that was proposed for New Jersey Transit, an agency, as we said, is critical to the state's economic success and having our first significant infusion of funds in nearly a decade. These sorely needed funds will stop the bleeding caused by the previous administration's neglect and allow us to fill critical operating positions that directly impact our customers' experience. We also are addressing some long-delayed capital projects, including the accelerated installation of the federally mandated safety enhancement uh, program called Positive Train Control, better known as PTC. Ultimately, we want to see New Jersey Transit have the funding it needs to revitalize our mission of delivering reliable service to our customers every day, and the proposed budget does just that. Adequate funding will allow NJT to stem the tide and put the brakes on using capital funds to pay for our operating expenses. And the governor's proposed budget will give our agency the ability to competently plan and implement safety and other important improvements system-wide. No one understands the need of New Jersey Transit better than the members of the legislature, who I listened to before taking the job over various uh, uh, forums uh, that uh, studied the challenges that we faced last year and know the public transportation is vital to their constituents. The governor's budget will provide a renewed fiscal stability that will put New Jersey Transit back on track on the road to recovery and finally position us to restore New Jersey Transit to the rightful place that we once held a number of years ago. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. I want to lastly, before we take a few questions, want to ask my friend, the county executive here of Mercer County, a county that runs uh, really well, uh, Brian Hughes, to come up and say a few words. Brian? Thank you very much. First of all, I want to uh, uh, echo the governor's first uh, topic and to say that Mercer County will never house children and illegally cage children. Uh, in the state of in, the, in Mercer County, even though we have the county resources, even though we've been approached by ICE and some others uh, to, to do just that. We will never happen in Mercer County, and that's my commitment to you today. I, I want to say, uh, uh, you know my wife Pamela, our governor. We used to cut the uh, six. 25 years ago, we would catch a 657 out of Princeton Junction. We had one car between us. That 657 was there almost every single day, right on time, right, ready to go to New York, uh, which you worked in every single day. And I want to tell you something. That is not the case today. You can't rely on a 657 anymore because New Jersey Transit has had such an up and down uh, uh, years since then. I want to tell you, I want to get to the point where people can rely on New Jersey Transit to get them to New York, to get them to Philadelphia, to get them where they need to go day in and day out with the reliability that it used to have and that the state used to be known for. I want to thank the governor for this opportunity. I want to thank him for a budget that puts priorities first on the transit users and not on millionaires and billionaires and corporations. Thank you very much, Governor. Here is an interested uh, observer. It's great to have my small acknowledge BPU Commissioner, uh, former Senator Bob Ward is with us. Bob, great to have you. With that, we'll take a few questions, please. Governor, go please. Governor, last week you, you said that you were open to negotiations with lawmakers uh, over the budget, and then yesterday Senate President Steve Sweeney said that you told him, and he said, quote, uh, almost verbatim, uh, the things that I'll cut from you, the things that I'll cut, I already cut, the things on the cutting room floor are on the cutting room floor, past my budget. I mean, are we to glean from Senate uh, President's statement that you you think their, their proposals are not worth negotiating, that you didn't hear any good proposals from them? that are worth um, co coalescing around? Let me, let me give you the facts, if I may. We had a, uh, a meeting last Friday morning at 8.30 among the leadership and our team, small group. And we met for, I don't know, an hour and a half. And we, we agreed to reconvene at noon uh, after having reflected on where each other's positions were. Uh, 
and we all left, we all broke at 10 o'clock in good faith. We actually spent, I think I mentioned this the other day, I spent most of my time in that period answering a question that the Senate President, I think, had asked me. If, we, if, if you get your budget, what does it look like in the year after? You know, are we driving the car off the cliff, or is this, can you show us some evidence that this, this machine will keep humming and that we won't have to have these big tax discussions again in the near term? So we did a fair amount of research on that, and I did personally, and, and, uh, and by the way, we came up, in my humble opinion, with very satisfactory answers. We were reconvening at noon at 11.31. You could look this up, Bloomberg, I'm not sure if Bloomberg's here, but uh, a story came out at 11.31, I believe, on Friday morning, saying that there was an impasse and, and negotiations that broke down. Uh, so you could take that for what it's worth. Uh, that's not how I see this at all. I, I am married with great passion to the principles of sustainable revenue and sustainable, sustainable funding, a, a historic reinvestment in our middle class, including NJ Transit. Am I a reasonable individual? Have I ever said, heck no, my way of the highway? Never, never. I was asked actually at the end of the meeting that even happened after that story came out, which took us all, I was asked as of last Friday, are you still, are you still, you know, supporting a millionaire's tax and a sales tax. I said, as I sit here midday on Friday, whatever that date is, yeah. Uh, I might add that the other, the, the legislative leadership have taken those off the table. I didn't take them off the table. So I'm a reasonable guy as long as we can, we can achieve the principles that we're talking about. But when you see that you're at a budget impasse while you're, while you're working on a, a follow-up meeting in good faith, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Paul, it's a rare opportunity, so I want to call on you. Um, and I still read your stuff, even though I still don't agree with most of what you write. I bet I could beat you in the 5K, too. You said that. What's your time? Last one I did in 2656. 2656? Yeah. Are you and I going to go neck to neck? I just did Red Bank on Saturday at 27. Oh. So let's find a day. I'm on. I'm on. All right. Anyhow, this is the second time we talked about a dedicated source of revenue here. But as you know, the income tax is dedicated to property tax relief. Your treasurer says the sales tax is needed for the general fund. What is the recurring source of revenue for NJ Transit? Well, there's nothing right now dedicated. This just is. Um, this is not dedicated. This could be removed, ne removed next year. So I know. I know. Um, uh, Michael asked me this question at some point. Is this really a tripling? Is the 242 really a tripling? And the answer is it is from the general fund. Uh, and unlike, uh, and I want to speak for Diane or Kevin, but I think this is pretty accurate. Unlike school funding formula, which is a multi-year buildup to achieve hopefully a new and smarter formula, uh, getting this funding level up and keeping it at that level is the key with NJ Transit. So we're not asking, this is not the first step of 242 this year or 442 then uh, in, increase on top of that the next year. And so assuming we get those sources of revenue, uh, this gets us into a, assuming we can fund it mul multiple years, it gets us in a very good place. Tom, do you have something? Do you, uh, we're going to go talk to Democratic leaders, and I'm sure they're going to say, our budget has the 242 as well. Are you going to line item veto any of this spending out if they present the budget they're going to pass Thursday? So I'll just say two things. One is we're, we're all options remain on the table in terms of how we would react. And I think I said that yesterday, that there's nothing changed there. Um, and I know that they've said, and, I, and, I, and I'm, not, I'm not questioning good faith here, that they've said, we, we, I've got 95% of what I want. Well, that's just on, on one side of the ledger. You need, you need to balance the books here. As I said yesterday, it's a little bit like saying, listen, the good news is you've got the house for $250,000. The bad news is we're giving you a 90-day loan or a 60-day loan. So while it may be in the budget, I'm not going to stare a computer in the eye who's digging out and gasping after eight years of the ridiculousness that this has become and say, listen, we've got this on a sustainable path. So while they may have the investment in their budget, they don't have the sustainable revenues to pay for it. Governor? Matt, did you get my pen, by the way? No, no, uh, but I'm looking forward to it. Okay. I wasn't around yet. I so, believe me, I noticed. I looked for you. But thank you. This uh, is, by the way, I just want to reiterate that we finally got the Bob Turtle named as the uh, New Jersey <laughs> State Reptile. Yes, uh, so... Um, and we had a celebration. <laughs> So, uh, have you asked for another meeting with Sweeney and Coughlin, um, and have you spoken to either of them since their press conference yesterday? 
not, not since yesterday. I had an exchange with Craig yesterday morning, but the fact of the matter is I've said publicly and privately we're here any moment of any hour of any day. Charlie. Um, underlying this, and I've been pressing before, underlying some of the resistance is this fear of backlash um, that, that the Democrats sign on to this, that they're going to face uh, the consequences of the ballot box down the road. What, what have, have you said to that, and what have you given assurances to them as a, as a, Democrat, as a leader of the Democratic Party that that's really, you know, Maybe not something all, all that much so I, I, by the way, I always read also what you write, Charlie, and I read what you wrote, and I'm thinking to myself, I've been telegraphing a millionaire's tax, I think, for going on three years. Uh, we won by over two touchdowns. Uh, big Democratic majorities. Everybody knew exactly the basis upon which we got elected. That sustaining sustainable revenues, a historic investment in the middle class, undoing tax gimmicks, it was completely transparent. So I would look to an election. I would look to any polling you can find. Uh, raise, raise your hand if you were, if you had people lined up outside your offices when the sales tax got cut from 7% to 6 and 5 A's uh, celebrating that and thanking you for it. And by the way, the same crowd will join you outside your offices when we undo that tax giving and put it back to where it was. This, this, no, these are obvious no-brainers in every bit of evidence uh, su supports it. This is a little bit like denying climate change. Go Max, back. it's a rare opportunity to have you here as well. Thank you, sir. Given this legislative leadership structure and how intransigent and how resistant it is to your budget right now, do you plan or do you see the potential, sir, to run primaries or back those progressive candidates who would be more in line with your priorities in the 2019 election? It's never occurred to me. And let me maybe make a point that uh, I should have made up front. It's the 19th. I'm com I, I remain optimistic we're going to figure this out. I'm not suggesting these people are of bad will. I think I said this yesterday. I don't think you were there. The conversations that we've had, we're not throwing food at each other. Uh, there are fundamental disagreements about how we should conduct the affairs of the state going forward. And I'm here. I got elected to rescue the middle class and put in place a fiscally responsible plan to do so. It's that simple. I think at the end of the day, we'll find common ground. Governor. Please. Uh, yes, Governor. Uh, on timing for the deal, would you do that immediately after the legislature passes the budget, or would you wait? Would, uh, would not, have, have not given that any thought yet. Would keep all options available. Governor, Please. Governor. No, sorry, Matt, before I get you. Michael. I, I'll come back to you, Matt. Uh, on the topic of sustainability in the future, the Senate President yesterday said that the reason why the corporate tax surcharge would phase out after two years is that, at its essence, New Jersey has a spending problem, and that it's two years to get our hands around some of those costs. So what would your response well, be? Listen, I, I, with all res due respect, uh, the, first of all, the CBT, as I understood it yesterday, at 4% four per, four for the bigger companies, puts us number one in the nation. So we have to question the competitiveness in a big way. As I think I mentioned yesterday, a millionaire for the most part, and I, by the way, I, I, I'm confident we can convince the wealthiest among us that the investments we're making in the state, including on things like transit, is going to benefit everybody, including them, and that they'll stay here, uh, and we're not going near the estate tax, which is a bigger issue for a lot of folks, even folks who you might not think of in the super wealthy category. Uh, but the, the, the fact of, of the matter is, if, if I'm wrong and one of them leaves, one of them leaves. Uh, I mentioned a company I was speaking with the other day, and they've got over 2,000 employees here. If they were to leave, those are 2,000 employees, not one of which is a millionaire. Not one. They're middle class, upper middle class. Those are houses that will be empty, jobs that will be unfilled, restaurants that won't get visited, whatever it might be. So the competitive element of this is a big issue. But, but how, can you, how can we all accept with a straight face when the state cut NJ Transit funding by 90% uh, that We've got a spending issue when we stop investing in the thing. You, you, you get what you pay for. And I'm all in for cutting fat wherever we can find it. And the one that really, the bone that sticks in most people's throats, I think I answered this to Tom yesterday, is first and foremost the property tax bone. And there are, there's no magic wand there. There's a bunch of different steps we have to take. But uh, you, you get what you pay for. Save the Children ranked us two weeks ago as the number one state in the nation to raise a kid. 
safety, nutrition, education, whatever it might be. That's not free. So it's a good value for money state, right? So let's get that equation back in line, particularly with property taxes and breaking the back of that. I'm all in fully committed to that. But if you want the trains to run on time, if you want to stop paying a fare increase, if you want reliability of your bus service, you got to invest. So it's not a spending problem, it's a, we've got a priorities problem. Uh, we, we gave away the store and, and we didn't, you know, people, people not only say, man, um, uh, it, it's expensive to live here. The, the, the more frequent question I get is, where'd all the money go? Where'd all the money go? A couple others, Matt, before I go to you, I will come to you. Anybody else without moving and asked yet? Please. Um, when do you plan to meet again with Sweeney and Coughlin with 11 days to go until June 30th? What are the chances of a government shutdown right now? Listen, I mentioned a minute ago, I remain optimistic that we'll find common ground. I'm available to meet every minute of every hour of every day. I got nothing higher on my books uh, than, in terms of priorities than this. Now, what's going on with the NJ Transit audit? You said in January that that would happen Diane, soon. Diane, we've started later than we, we, we wanted it to just because we want to make sure we get it right, but please. Thanks, Governor. So uh, the audit started uh, about a month, month and a half ago. Um, they are actively working up at New Jersey Transit in terms of doing operational interview, operational reviews and operational interviews with the staff, um, and we expect to have the final report from them by the end of August. Thank you. Matt. Governor, any reaction? I don't know if you saw the Assembly Minority Leader's comments yesterday. He likened you to an uh, inexperienced dictator. Um, I mean, do you have any reaction to what the, uh, John Brandick had to say? I had a problem with the word inexperienced, but I had no issue with the dictator piece. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's not true. Uh, yeah, listen, I would say a couple of things. One is, and I want to say this in particular to John, John was one of the first guys who stood up for me personally. Yesterday, we were, we were in a really rough patch, and I will never forget that. Uh, in a different vein, if, and by the way, John has called me extreme, and so I would just say extreme in, 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 in experience. I'll just comment on each of them. If, if you think uh, reinvesting in the middle class, in NJ Transit, in universal pre-K, in K through 12 education, in access to higher education. If you think that's extreme, I'm your guy. Uh, if you think that the way of doing business in Trenton is to cut one deal after another and kick the can down the road and make the next generation pay the price and push off our responsibilities today, you betcha I'm inexperienced. And I look forward to never, ever being experienced at that. Tom. If, if the legislature accepted the sales tax increase of three-eighths of a penny, how close would that put you to a deal? Is this really about half a penny in the end? Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't speculate on how close or not it would be, but, but some common, finding some common ground was something that looks so obvious to me and to us. As you can see, I'm not alone up here. Uh, it's not like we don't have sort of the facts on our side. That would be a major step in the right direction. Please. Uh, you mentioned you're signing this executive I still owe you a soccer uh, interview, by the way. <laughs> uh, executive order related today regarding the policy of separate, of not allowing yes. state resources to go towards the separation of the independence. Would this have any practical effect whatsoever on the parents being housed in North Jersey jail that have been separated from the children? I actually, I, I, I don't know the answer to this. We're just, it's so abhorrent in Elizabeth that we don't even know who's in the, the facility. Um, and it's a federal facility. Uh, so any, any amount of resources, and that would include the National Guard, by the way, uh, are, are, are off the table from us. Okay. I actually can't give you a precise answer about getting inside of a federal facility in, in terms of what, what our powers are. Please, let me go behind you, sorry. Governor, uh, have, have you, uh, are you calling on, is it time for voters to call lawmakers and ask them to vote for a millionaire tax? Sounds like Ray just did. Uh, uh, <laughs> Are you endorsing that? Listen, I, I think we can, we got elected for a reason. It's why you know, I've never been, listen, do people have the right to protest and stand up and, and be, be heard? You betcha they do. So no one's going to take anybody first, first Amendment rights away from them. Um, but, you know, I, I, I always think you have elections for a reason, as opposed to why you go back and you don't run a state. Like California had that period where they ran on a referenda. Uh, I've never been a big fan of that because people get elected and you have a full transparent airing of opinions, you have debates, uh, people are able to stand up and advertise on both sides. We got elected, we should be able to figure this out. Charlie? Just checking the trade series you're asking. The Crescent's still an hour 15 late. Um, 
how, how concerned are you about the, the image of the Democratic Party uh, and spent years getting to this position of, of having full control of the state house? And the minute you have it, you're facing dysfunction, gridlock, and a government shutdown. I mean, how, what kind of uh, political fallout are, are you concerned about? Is it, is it more concerned about that or fallout of, you know, what do you think raising taxes? So I, I, I'm still of the opinion, and I believe history is going to prove us right, but history will, will, will be the judge of that, that we can have it both ways. One of the things that in our private leadership meetings we discussed last week was let's not let the public narrative undermine a lot of stuff that we've gotten done already. So I would just quibble a little bit with the minute you got there, you had this big. We got a lot of stuff done here together with their, with their leadership and with us. Some of it was easy and some of it was not easy at all. You look at the discourse around the nuclear bill in December and look at the strength of that bill, as well as, as importantly, not more so for me, the green energy bill that got built up alongside of that, that took a lot of work by all parties. And I think we all need to remember that and, and take some amount of credit. Um, having said that, we're the big tent party, aren't we? As I said yesterday, we wear that as a badge of honor but it probably causes us a lot more headaches historically than the other guys. Although they're having their own headaches these days. We'll let them uh, in, in their own Tea Party reality nationally and whatnot. But um, I think at the end of the day, coming up with the right principles and putting this state finally back to investing in the middle class and on firm fiscal footing, people will stand back and say, you know what, it may have been a little bit messy, it may have taken a little bit longer, but you all ended up doing the right thing. Please. All of the above is not true. We're talking to both sides, and we're willing to negotiate any minute of any hour of any day. Michael. <laughs> Governor, yesterday you threatened to veto their budget if it, if it passes uh, this week. Uh, do, you, do you stand by that position? They're presumably voting this afternoon in committees to pass that budget. Do I stand by what I said yesterday? Yeah. Yes. Thank you all so much for coming out. I want to thank these folks for being with me today. All right?